Welcome to episode 39 of the Gluttons for Punishment podcast, or GFP, a Toronto Maple Leafs and NHL podcast hosted by Michael Lapore and Anthony Bruno. He's Lapore. I'm Bruno. Thank you so much for listening and watching us on YouTube as well. If you're a new listener and you enjoy the show, we would really appreciate it if you give us a five-star rating and review on Apple. And if you're watching on YouTube and you enjoy the content, it would be a big time help if you smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, and ring the notification bell so you know exactly when the GFP podcast is posting some new content. All right, everybody. As of Sunday, October 31st, Halloween night, the Toronto Maple Leafs appear to be back on track with two straight wins over the Blackhawks and Red Wings. It was a solid bounce back week after the second week of the season, which was a complete disaster and had a lot of people in Leafs Nation very, very frightened that this season was going to go off the cliff like the 18-wheeler. So it was good to see the Leafs actually bounce back and show some life. And we are going to get into the week that was and give you our thoughts and opinions on everything that went down with this team. But first, it is time to welcome in my partner in crime, Mr. Michael Lapore. How you doing, man? I'm doing well, Anthony Bruno. It is dark out. It is gloomy out. It is raining. But you're not going to hear a complaint out of me because it's October 31st. Happy Halloween. And my favorite hockey team is on a winning streak. How does that sound? Episode 39, shout out to... Travis Green, what a player, fan favorite for the Leafs, and uh, just got reminded that he was on the last Leafs team to uh, make the conference finals. So, I mean, it sounds like it feels like ages ago that a Leafs team was in the conference oh, finals, God. a series away from the Stanley Cup. But here we are in Leaf land, still, still waiting. Travis Green, great player, man, exciting player. He's one of those players that, like, you look back and, like, players were different back then like different skating styles like the way they looked the way their jerseys fit and he was one of those guys that you could spot travis green a mile away because of just how he carried himself on the ice and his style great great player i I, he's one of those guys i always love to see jerseys like you'll see like a random green 39 like i appreciate that like yeah i I love seeing those random leaf jerseys in the crowd when you're at games you're watching on tv and you're like whoa i forgot that this guy actually played for the leafs and someone's wearing his jersey sitting in the third row yeah, I always wonder what the story is when it's like a really random one. You're like, why do you get that one? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can't there's, help but cross There's always mind. a crazy story. Yeah, Something like was it a gift? Behind that. Was it a gift? Was it on sale? But anyways, speaking of Toronto Maple Leafs jerseys, something very special happened last night. Something that Leafs fans have been waiting very patiently for. Last night against the Detroit Red Wings, Mitch Marner. Scored his first goal of the season. Woo! Get up and cheer, everybody. Mitchie Marner is on the board. And at the Gluttons for Punishment podcast, we thought we'd celebrate by giving away an authentic Adidas Mitch Marner jersey. A few weeks ago, we gave away an authentic Austin Matthews jersey to celebrate episode 34 of the show. So we thought, why not? Let's, let's keep it going. Let's make more people happy, more of our fans happy. So if you want to get your hands on a Mitch Marner authentic home Toronto Maple Leafs jersey, comment down below with your Instagram Instagram handle. Well, first things first, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, like the video, and then comment down below with your Instagram handle and, and get ready for it. Who, in your opinion, are the ideal line mates for Mitch Marner and why? I love it, Lapore. The first jersey giveaway went very well. We gave away the Austin Matthews jersey to a lucky fan. And now we're giving away this Marner jersey. And you said it, man. He finally scored his first goal in 17 games, regular oh, season and playoffs man. combined. Man. I, I, I can't even believe that. Like, just hearing those words come out of my mouth, like, how the hell does a guy like Mitch Marner go that long without scoring a goal? But we are happy that he finally got the monkey off his back. And it's the perfect time 
for this Marner jersey giveaway. So once again, as Lapore said, to enter the Mitch Marner authentic home jersey giveaway, you must like the video, subscribe to the channel, and then in the comments section down below, leave your Instagram handle, tell us where you're from, and who you think are the two ideal line mates for Mitch Marner and why. Yeah, I, th I think I forgot that part. Tell us where you're from as well. Yeah, exactly. So we can't wait for this giveaway. Get those entries in. And uh, we're going to make another GFC, GFP supporter very, very happy. Yeah, I can't wait. All right, Lapore. Time to get into some Leafs talk now. Let's do it. And just to give a brief rundown of how the week went. So last week was a disaster. <laughs> three games, three losses. And the Leafs started this past week with another loss, losing to the Carolina Hurricanes and Freddie Anderson. So that was their fourth straight loss. And Freddie Anderson, he has been fantastic to start the season through his first six games, 6-0, six and oh, with a 133 goals against average and a 956 save percentage. Because, of course. Like, it's just... That's just how it works. That's just how the universe works. You know, guys leave the Toronto Maple Leafs and then go on to be, you know, the best players in the National Patrick Hockey Wall. League. <laughs> yeah. It is unbelievable. But the Leafs started off the week with their fourth straight loss. Leafs Nation was about to... Uh, they thought the 18-wheeler was, was coming down the road and it was flying off the cliff. Just yeah. like we all know happened in the past with this team, the famous 18-wheeler mm -hmm. situation. But luckily, the Leafs were able to bounce back against the Chicago Blackhawks on Wednesday night. The Blackhawks are just a terrible hockey team right now. Not only are they awful on the ice, everything happening off the ice with the sexual assault scandal, yeah. it is just absolute turmoil over there. That, that team is a complete train wreck right now. So that was an extremely important win for the Leafs, coming back from two goals down to win 3-2 in overtime. And then the Leafs closed out the week Saturday night at home, beginning a five-game homestand, beating the Red Wings 5-4 to four for their second win of the week. But Lepore, let's start things off with that Carolina Hurricanes game on Monday night where the Leafs lost 4-1. to one. Take us through that game and give us your thoughts. All right. Well, let's step back here for a second. Leafs fans getting ready for this game, going into Carolina a team that was absolutely scorching hot. Leafs were playing like trash, playing our former goalie. What could possibly go wrong? We all should have bet our freaking houses on this one because there was no way the Leafs were coming out with the W just because they are the Toronto Maple Leafs. But things actually started optimistically. Austin Matthews with the wraparound goal, his first of the season, and what a goal. I'm sure he uh, chirped Freddie about that afterwards, that he was able to get his first one on him. But things look good. The Leafs were like weathering the storm. And they were able to leave the first period with a lead. Campbell made some big saves. Like, I, I can't believe, like, I know Campbell gets a lot of credit. But I think it's to the point now where we really have to sit, sit back and ask ourselves just how important Jack Campbell is to this team. Because there's a lot of timely saves that happened over the course of uh, this week that really could have turned games around in, in a bad way if he wasn't there to bail us out. Uh, in the second, speaking of, he made an absolutely crazy save on Jesper Fast. The, the Leafs made a mistake in the offensive zone. The puck came back the other way. It was a two-on-one, and Campbell made an absolute beauty of a save. Like, uh, unreal, unreal. But couldn't keep them off the board forever. It was uh, Sebastian Ajo who was able to tip in a goal. Spezza was on him in front, being where he should be playing center, but just couldn't uh, get a hold of Aho's stick. And credit to him, it was a great tip. And, like, what a player Aho is. So 1-1 one, one at that point. And the second goal, man, the second goal, it was the dermot Sandine pair. Dermot took a shot that got blocked in the at the offensive blue line. Yeah, that was brutal. Came back the other way. And those who are fans of the show know how much Bruno and I love Rasmus Sandin, but it was blatantly clear in the series against Montreal last year that he had a lot of talent, but the kid wasn't quite physically ready, like losing a lot of battles. There were two goals where like he took a hit 
and that whole thing of taking a hit, like you pay the price. No, no, no. He just lost the puck. Like it was bad, bad, bad. And he got out muscled. He got out muscled. Yeah, plain he got simple, out. man. It, yeah. And you know what? I'm glad you brought up that Hab series because it took me right back to that Hab series. That was yeah. the one glaring weakness he had where he'd just get muscled off the puck. And and you know what? He was going up against a, a physically bigger player. Yeah. So, Lawrence, but you yeah. still expect him to hold his ground and make that play. But it was just a brutal play all around. Like you said, Dermot gets the shot block. Sandine, Sandine gets out muscled. And the Leafs go down. So it was just a bad look all around. Yeah, just not good. And like those little things. And this is where you just knew. Like this is when things were really bad for the Leafs. So at that point it was two to one. And Tavares took a pass. I think it was from Kerfoot. And he fired it low glove on Freddie. Hit the post. Freddie made some big saves after that. And it was just like, this is how the season's going so far. Like these, like these little moments that aren't going our way. Like God forbid Tavares, the Tavares shot hits the post and goes in and now we're two, two, right. But no, just bad. Uh, later in the uh, second period, it was a uh, Nita rider who uh, scored the goal. Marner got absolutely walked by Slavin at the blue line, like absolutely walked. Like I've always made the point that sometimes from a defensive perspective, guys can be almost, they're too good of skaters for their own good. So it kind of forces them to commit. Whereas like the guy who's not as fleet of foot is more aware of what he lacks. So he just kind of stays calm and relaxes where it's a good skater flies right at the guy. And that's what Marner did there. Like he just like attacked, attacked uh, Slavin. And he just like went around him like boop around corner goal. So it was a mistake. It was a mistake. I remember right after the goal, the camera went right on Marner and he deserved it, man. Like you got walked in the defensive zone. I'm sure Keith filled his year with that one. So instead of uh, two to one going into the third, it's now three to one Leafs down by two. Um, some early chances. Matthews had some chances. Like Matthews has been good, like beyond his goal. Like, like he's, he's on now, man. He's back. Yeah. He and like, some- he only has two points in six games, but the chances have been there. Yeah, like it's only sure. a matter of time before the floodgates open with Matthews. For sure. Like I said, he had some early chances. Willie hit the post. So again, like these little things that were happening, happening to us. Willie shot goes in and it's three, two, like now we're in a game, but nope, won't go in. So still tra- uh, trailing uh, three to one. And then there was the two on one. There was a two on one that Marner had with Kerfoot and like Marner's got the puck and you know, he's going to pass it. And he was able to get it over to Kerfoot for the scoring chance. And he wasn't even able to get a shot away. He tried, in my opinion, he overthought it. Like, I I don't, I'm not that guy who typically likes to yell, shoot the puck, but he got it in a great chance. And then he like did this, like cut to the back end. It's like, no, just shoot it, man. Like you're flying, you're going hundred miles an hour. You're going to mess up. If you try and move, it's exactly what happened. So a great scoring chance went without a shot. And then it was a Sveshnikov who scored uh, to make it four to one on an empty net. The shots were 36-25 in favor of the Carolina Hurricanes. And according to our friends at Money Puck, the Canes would have won this game 61% of the time based on the underlying numbers. So not a good showing for the Leafs in terms of the scoreboard. And one thing that we held on to earlier in the season, even after losses with the Leafs played well, they just got unlucky. No, they got outplayed in this game. Like, Carolina is the real deal, man. Like for years, I think people have kind of been rooting for Carolina, like small market team. Everyone loves Rod Brindamore, either because you loved him as a player or you just like him as a coach now or both. But the Carolina Hurricanes are not screwing around, man. That is a good, good hockey team. Very good hockey team. That's a really good team. And I thought that they might take a step back losing Dougie Hamilton a lot because, of people did yeah. as you know I'm like the number one Dougie Hamilton fan you know this Lepore I talked about it on like seven different podcasts losing him in free agency I, I thought was going to be a really big blow to this team mm-hmm. but this is a very good hockey team up and down the lineup they got a lot of depth up front Sebastian Ajo has now emerged as one of the stars in the league like Super he's a legit elite. number one center Super, and their oh, yeah. and their decor is still really good and they brought in Tony D'Angelo who's had a, a rough go in the National Hockey League, mostly because he's been an idiot. Yeah. Especially playing for, those who for the don't New York know, Rangers. When for he, those who don't know, Google Tony D'Angelo. Yeah, don't Google Tony D'Angelo if you want to see uh, some of the 
crap that that guy's been up to in his career. But I mean, he, uh, yeah, he essentially like got into a fight with Alexander Gorgiev on New York and there was some other stuff going on. Anyway, he lands in Carolina and he's essentially been a point per game player for them. He's playing on their top power play unit, filling in for Dougie Hamilton. I don't think he's like the defensive um, as good defensively as Dougie Hamilton, but it just seems like this Carolina Hurricanes team has not missed a beat. Freddie Anderson, as I mentioned, has been unbelievable for this team. And yeah, I mean, that team's the real deal. And I thought that they thoroughly outplayed the Leafs. Yeah. There's just no other way to say it. The Leafs got outplayed in this game and yeah. pretty much every single period. Like this is a team, this Carolina team was beating them to every puck. You, you could just tell that they were playing faster than the Leafs. Their yep. team speed, team defense. It yep. was just, they're, they're a well, well-oiled machine. And I, you know, after that game, I was like, man, oh man, this is, you know, four losses in a row now, thoroughly outplayed by the Carolina Hurricanes. Like if they don't turn this thing around in a hurry, I mean, Leafs Nation might be done with this team, yeah. you know, five, six games into the season. Like yeah. it was looking really, really bleak. But yeah, that was my big takeaway from the game. Lepore is just how badly outplayed uh, the Leafs got. But then also what happened after the game was Sheldon Keefe. Oh. I mean, some of the comments that I heard from him, it, it really pissed me off. And listen, I, I'm a Sheldon Keefe guy. I've defended this guy ever since he basically took over for Mike Babcock. But some of the excuses I heard after the game, he goes, you know, we learned more lessons tonight. Like, how many fucking lessons do the Leafs have to learn, Lapore? Yeah, it wasn't what people wanted to hear at that time. They lose, like, the, oh, you know, the losing was in the bad. first round five years in a row, losing all these deciding games, whether it's game seven of the playoffs, game five of the playoffs, blowing a 3 1 lead to Montreal, losing to a Zamboni driver. Go down the list. This team has learned enough lessons. The core of this team has learned enough lessons. So to hear some of the excuses that Sheldon Keefe, was spewing after the game saying, you know, we finally got a taste of what it's like to play a Stanley cup contender. And it's only going to make us better now moving forward this season. Cause now we know how to play teams like this. Like, I don't want to hear that stuff. No yeah, one in Leafs Nation wants to hear that shit. This is a, is a talented Leafs team. And all Leaf fans wanted to see was for this team to figure it out, to wake up, to start scoring goals and look more like the team we saw from last season. So I was I was very frustrated uh, hearing Keith and even some of the other comments from some of the other players after that Carolina Hurricanes game. Yeah, like I think qu quite often I try to step back and not really dial into what the coaches and players are saying after the game because like let's face it like they're just trying to give an answer and say the right thing That's so fair. sometimes like verbal diarrhea can come out or like they they just say something that they didn't really mean. But whether that was the case or not, it was just the worst look. Like fans, fans were tired of this team before the season started. And then they got out to a bad start to the season. And then there's this game where you did not look good at all. Fans did not want to hear that voice. And it's kind of funny how things go back and forth. And you see it in coaching changes in the NHL where a team will go to like, you know, the coach, the, uh, the players coach to the hard ass and fans kind of always get sick of one eventually. And then the other guy gets brought in to change things up. Cause even like for the players, they get sick of that type of mood. Like almost in that moment, I think what Leafs fans would have appreciated was the hard ass. Like, we're just not good enough right now. We have to be better. We need more from our stars. Well, like all those lines. And he came out with that and it, it just, it, it wasn't good. It wasn't good. And also too, to his point about like a Stanley cup contending team to me, that made it worse because this, that is what the Leafs aspire to be. And during this game, we got a straight look at what a contender is like th this Carolina team, man, they play big, they play fast. It, they, they remind me of those old, like kind of like when the West was way better than the East. Yes. And th th those teams would come at you in waves like Anaheim and then Chicago and LA where it's like, they're just physically dominant. Like th th five minutes into a game, you knew a team was defeated because they were just getting physically dominated. Carolina reminds me of those teams. So for us to get a look at what a Stanley cup contender looks like and a team that's going to, that is in the same conference as the Toronto Maple Leafs. And then to come out with that, 
nah, it, it, the, the timing for Sheldon was bad. Like, as you mentioned, we love, we love Keith, Keith. And, but uh, no, 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 like the wrong words came out at the wrong time. Yeah. That was just a very, very bad look across the board for the Leafs losing their fourth game in a row. Is there anything else you want to get off your chest about this game, Lapore, or shall we move on? No, let's move on to the positive stuff of the week. We're done with the negative, right? It's time for a quick break for a word about my bookie, which has partnered with the Gluttons for Punishment podcast. When we gamble, we're always looking for a way to get an edge. But in my bookie, they double your first deposit. So you start with a leg up. Use the promo code GFP to sign up now, claim your first deposit bonus with my bookie, and use the extra funds to kickstart your winning season. The Leafs are in the middle of a five-game homestand with games against the Golden Knights, Lightning, Bruins, and Kings coming up. Might be a good week to sprinkle some money on them if you think they're back in business. Or maybe you're crazy like us and still think betting on the Leafs to win the Cup at 12-1 to 1 is good value. Don't just take our word for it. Head to my bookie and sign up now using the promo code GFP to get your money doubled and start winning today. Doubling your money. That's pretty incredible. The only thing better than gambling with your own money is gambling with somebody else's money. And as Bruno mentioned with the GFP promo code, they double your first deposit, double. So free money to lay down bets on whatever you want. You miss out hockey, the NFL, the NBA. Go for it, guys. Have some fun. You said it, Lapore. What a great deal. Remember, good friends don't let friends win alone. So have your buddies use your referral link so you're eligible to receive an additional 250% bonus on their first deposit. Plus, it's unlimited to redeem so all your friends can join the party at my bookie. Bet anything, anytime, anywhere with my bookie. Manscaped is the best in men's below the waist grooming, offering precision engineered tools for your family jewels. Manscaped just launched its fourth generation trimmer, the Lawnmower 4.0. Join over 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you, GFP Nation 20% off and free shipping with the code GFP20 at manscaped.com. Lapore, these products are awesome. Yeah, man. Uh, those watching on YouTube can see that the hair on the top of my head and on my face is an absolute disaster. But in the areas where Manscaped is uh, A+, plus, things are looking good, bud. So uh, as we have mentioned earlier, we're so happy with the products there of the highest quality. We wouldn't want to partner with a brand that we didn't have a lot of confidence in. And uh, we're honored. We're honored to be with Manscaped. Great company, great products, and we couldn't be happier. Well said, Lapore. The Lawnmower 4.0 is awesome. It's an incredible experience. If you've ever used this, I highly recommend it. They got a ton of great products on the website. So definitely be sure to check that out. And once again, you can get 20% off and free shipping with the code GFP20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com using the code GFP20. This game was absolutely massive was on, crazy on game, Wednesday, man. to say the least. Like, I cannot express how, how nervous I was heading into this game. <laughs> Because Man. It, it almost felt like the season was on the line. As crazy as that sounds, like it 100%. sounds insane to say, but it truly felt like the Leafs season and this entire core and the management group and Sheldon Keefe, it just felt like everything was on the line. Just and teetering. Yeah, it's exactly. going to go one way or the and other. If, if yeah. one more thing went wrong, like God forbid they lost to this Chicago Blackhawks team, who knows what would have happened. Like yeah. we could have seen the entire operation crumble to the ground, mm -hmm. but I mean, yeah, it, it was just like, it was an absolute must win game. Like I mentioned, the Blackhawks have been awful this season and their record as it stands at the time of this podcast, let me just double check their record right now. They're Oh, seven and two. They have a minus 20 goal differential. They've been absolutely dominated at five on five. Their defense core sucks. Their goaltending sucks. Mark andre Fleury has been a mess. Shout out to Michael Lepore. As we all know, he always calls Mark Super fan Fleury number one over here, Mark andre Fleury. Of all time, and he has been awful this season. Offensively, they've been a mess. I know Patrick Kane 
has missed a bunch of games being in the COVID protocol and Taves only has two, two or three points this season. They've been a mess. And then of course, with the sexual assault scandal, watching that interview with Kyle beach on TSN earlier in the week, that's one of the most heartbreaking things I have ever seen. And it was disgusting how the NHL covered that up Mm -hmm. and going through that whole organization from, you know, the president and CEO down to the general manager, Stan Bowman, the Joel Quinville. Like it, it was just disgusting how everyone turned their back on Kyle beach. And it just seems like it seemed like that night specifically after that Kyle beach interview. And after seeing and hearing his side of the story, it it just seemed like the entire hockey world was rooting for the Toronto Maple Leafs to beat the Chicago Blackhawks on Wednesday night for for the first time in their 100 year, 100 year history. Everyone was supporting the blue and white. It felt weird. That's for sure. Yeah, for real. But uh, yeah, so I mean, the Leafs, and it got off to a bad start that game, Lapore. Like they went down 2 nothing in the first period. I told and- my buddy, so there, there was that, you mentioned how bad they've been. They had, before that Leafs game, they had not had a lead. That was that another thing. Goal, they did not have a lead all season. Like I'm pretty sure it broke the NHL record. And that's one of those things like, yeah, that's hard to do. Like over five games or seven games, whatever it was, not have a single lead. And I told my buddy the day before, bet Chicago to score first. Like, you just knew it was coming because, number one, because of the Toronto Maple Leafs. And number two, because of the uh, the rut we were in. And number three, because it would be the game where everyone's rooting for us and we just disappoint all of hockey with a terrible performance. And sure enough, the Chicago Blackhawks scored first and the commentators were quick to say for their first lead of the season just to rub it in but i will say it was a uh, kirby doc with the first goal and it was a hell of a goal like he came in with speed he made that a was great a move. sick goal he made a great move on muzzin um and uh, kind of turned him inside out like muzzin didn't do too poorly but doc just kind of got an angle and was able to snipe one and then it was to bring it great player. He yeah. is a great, that player. was another great goal. Yeah. What a snipe Two nothing on a breakaway and uh hall and Muzzin on the ice for that one. It's hall been tried a rough to... start to the season for those two. Yeah, They have like, looked completely out of sync compared to last season. Yeah. Like hall tried to get the puck out and he just couldn't get it as deep as he wanted. So then they came back the other way from center and then, like, they didn't get into good position. So, to bring it was just wide open for a breakaway. And he just came and sniped it. So, 2 nothing. The Leafs actually had a pretty good finish to the period. Um, they had eight straight shots at one point, but uh, just unable to get a goal. Uh, moving on to the second period, the Leafs get a hero. And it seems like lately he's the only hero. Well, him and Jason Spezza. But it was John Tavares. It was Riley entering the zone, dropped it to Marner, finds Tavares, sick backhand goal, leaves down two to one. That was a very Tavares goal, eh? Oh, just yeah. a great backhand. Like, yeah, it, that, you know, when you think of goal. John Tavares goals, like <laughs> yeah. that's that that was just such a John Tavares goal. I lo- I loved seeing it because that was like his first like actual goal of the season because right. he had a goal coming into that game, but it was, remember the puck like bounced off his arm right. in front of the net. So that must've right. felt good to actually score like a real NHL goal. Right. Right. Moving on in that period, like I mentioned in the previous game, there was a few moments for the Leafs where if they would have got a break, it would have totally flipped the game around while the Leafs did get the break in this game. Cause like I said, they're down two to one at this point and uh, Taze hit a post, he had an open net and he hit a post and there were some other chances that the Hawks had in close, but they, they weren't able to put a, put one past Campbell. Um, then even there was another breakaway too. Like looking back at this game, I'm pretty sure Chicago must have had like five, six breakaways or like semi breakaways. I'm just remembering they're popping him ahead of all these saves Campbell was making. Um, but then the Leafs got another hero, David Camp with the backhand. I goal. thought it was Tavares for a second, Lapore. When he scored that backhand goal as well, I'm like, wait, did Tavares just do the exact same thing? And then I I did a double take, and I'm like, hold on. No, it was David Camp that scored. Amazing, though. Scoring against his former team. Love to see that. Yeah, great goal. Um, He's been – I mean, Comp's been what he was expected to be so far, which is, I mean, good news for Leafs fans because, you know, he's he's a plug in the lineup, and he's good defensively, or the the story was that he was good defensively, and he has been so far. But to see him get a goal – in that moment too, like 
awesome. Awesome. And uh, yeah, like you said, against his former team. So it's always a great story. Now, moving on to, um, no, I'm forgetting. So if, if, if you remember right after that, the Leafs got a power play and here, and you're thinking, okay, momentum, Leafs going to take the lead. And there was that pass to Riley. I forget who was on the left, the right side. And they made a poor pass to Riley and he kind of like dove to keep it and kind of missed, you know, just went in the worst place again, like more towards the middle than the sideboards. And uh, it was McKenzie on a breakaway. And he made a pretty sick move to the back end, slid it under Campbell. And if you look at the replay, again, like hockey inches, right? It actually beat him between the legs, but just kind of caught like Campbell's ankle or skate just enough to steer it wide of the post. Like you always hear like, oh, it missed by an inch. That one actually missed by an inch. If that if that's one inch the other way, it just beats Campbell clean between the legs and the Leafs lose. L- Lepore, I'm not even kidding. And I probably speak for a lot of Leaf fans. I was legit ready to pack it in. If they had allowed a goal on that shorthanded oh. breakaway, oh. like I was, I was ready to almost pack it in for the season at that point and just lose all hope in this yeah. team. So I, I'm, I'm glad that we didn't go down that route and they found a way to win this game. But my goodness, like that, that's a play that, that sticks out to me for sure. And you, it would have been just, again, so Toronto Maple Leafs. I'm going to fight back, tie it, get a power play. And then like a just total ridiculous goal. Like the, that would have been to give up in that situation. Exactly. Just like, let it be a goal like that. And just let it be dramatic because, you know, because the Leafs, uh, the overtime, the overtime was amazing. Lots of back and forth, lots of chances. Matthews was buzzing, I thought. I will say, like, you made the point of how important of a game this was for the Leafs. As far as I'm concerned, like, this is on the list of most important regular season games for the Leafs in the last five years. I'm 100% with you. They had to win this game. And I will say, when Willie, on that breakaway, went to the backhand and scored, I went, like, full-on fanboy. Like I did a full, like jump off the couch, like fist pump scream. Yes. Just like, I'm sure a lot of it was really, you're not alone, man. Y'all man. I'm, I'm, I'm sure a lot of it was just, like internal anxiety, like getting released, getting released, seeing the Leafs win that game. But man, like I said, the importance of that game and the importance of that goal were just so, so big for this team. And you, and the thing is too, like, there's those cheesy things that happen that get laughed at, but did you see the Leafs celebrate that goal? Like Matthews, like Matthews led it to Nylander, so he was on the ice. Like Matthews was like that, like full on, like that was like that angry. It was like they won a playoff series. Oh my god! Just scoring like that Math- overtime goal. You see Matthews chirping the fan on the glass. Oh, I loved it. The fan Amazing. was giving him the finger, and Matthews is that was what it was? in his face. Yeah, I, I, I could see the fan was flipping him the bird. He was nice. chirping him, and nice. Matthews was just going. Right <laughs> yeah. in his face. So what a win. And you know what? It, it was so great, Laporte, to see that emotion from Matthews. Because earlier in the game, the cameras caught him on the bench, and it appeared that he was yelling at Hall for a mistake that he had made yes. on an earlier shift. So he's yes. yelling at guys on the bench. And then obviously he got really fired up after Nylander scored the overtime winner, getting into it with the fan. So it was finally good to see one of the star players, something we talked about on last week's show. Yeah. So sh- show some more emotion and vocal leadership and some and some heart. And I know it sounds very cliche, but we've been waiting for especially one he of the big guys. He showed it, man. Oh, man, everyone loved it. He showed it. Yeah, and we've been waiting for one of the core four to step up and, and show that emotion. And it was so, so nice to see it come from number 34. Yeah, no, it was awesome. And again, what a win and a huge sigh of relief. And would you look at that? The Toronto Maple Leafs made the entire hockey world happy. Who could have thought that was possible? But apparently Once in it a is. Lifetime thing. Once in a lifetime Everyone write it down because it'll probably never happen again. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a, it, it was a big relief, Lepore. Like, I, I, I would imagine that Sheldon Keith went into that game legitimately thinking that his job was on the line. Because, oh, yeah. you know, even close. thinking back to the, the press conference we talked about after the Carolina game, like imagine the Leafs had lost that game to Chicago to a team, like I said, just a complete train wreck at the moment. Like what does Sheldon Keefe say after that game? Yeah. His post-game media availability. Like what does he even say at that point if they lose again to that yeah. team? 
Yeah, like so, you weren't playing a contender this time. Like, what would you learn from this embarrassment, right? Just it, it and it would have put Dubis in a tough spot as well, because as we all know, Dubis and Keith have you know come up through the ranks deal. together, going back to junior in the AHL, now in the NHL together. Like, would he have felt pressure to actually make a coaching change? Would Shanahan have called a meeting? And, you know, talk to Dubis and, and Keith and said, you know what, like there, there needs to be changes here. And unfortunately it might have to come from management. Like I, I'm on, I honestly think it could have gotten to that point if they lost to the Chicago Blackhawks team. I think all of that was on the line. So it, it was good. It was good to see them fight back, you know, to come from two, nothing down and show the heart that they did. And for Matthews to take the bull by the horns and be that emotional leader and to get the guys going. And there was even talk that Wayne Simmons was the guy yeah. in the first intermission who spoke up and spoke said, listen, up. guys, yeah. it's, it's enough of feeling sorry for ourselves. It's time to snap out of it and actually wake up and execute here and come back and win this hockey game. And you know what? Credit to the Leafs. Like, obviously, you don't want to see them beat a team like that in overtime. You'd like to see them beat Chicago by a couple of goals in regulation, have it be more of a comfortable victory, but a win is a win. They battled yeah. back. They showed some heart. And that, that was great to see. Yeah. Uh, before I forget, it was a weird game. Like the Leafs outshot Chicago 40 to 29, but money puck. I mean, I did say like the Blackhawks did have a lot of high danger scoring chances. And I thought Campbell played really well. They had the Blackhawks winning this game 65% of the oh, time. Wow. Yeah, so like the underlying numbers, I guess, like Toronto got the shots on goal and probably the attempts on goal. But in terms of the actual true scoring chances, I mean, Chicago got a lot of them. So ring the alarms. Like we thought we were off the hook, at least for a little while, as far as uh, the Leafs defense sucks conversation uh, was going. But uh, after last year, how it looked so good. But I, I really hope we're not going in that direction again. And Laporte, just to go over some numbers in terms of how the Leafs have played defensively. So right now, 22nd in goals against per game. Okay. Uh, The penalty kill is at 82.8%, 15th in the NHL. Yeah. I mean, obviously the Leafs have also have a minus eight goal differential. Like it has been night and day in terms of how they played defensively last season compared to what we're seeing this season. Mm Mm-hmm. And for the most part, like Campbell's been good. He had that Very one good. bad game against Pittsburgh. But other than that, Campbell's been really solid. The numbers back it up. But this defense core has not been good. You know, we, we mentioned Muzzin and Hall. And we'll get into what, what happened with Justin Hall for the Red Wings game, how he was a, a healthy scratch. But just watching Muzzin and Hall, you know, through the first six, seven games this season, it wasn't pretty. Oh. Like they're giving up scoring chances left and right. They look slow. They're not moving the puck effectively. There were some really rough things going on. And, you know, I think I thought Riley and, and TJ Brody had played pretty well, you know, up in, you know, over the first seven, eight games. And even, uh, even Sandine, I know we talked about the mistake that he made in the Carolina game, getting out muscled on that, uh, you know, that one-on-one chance, but for the most part, I think it was Muzzin and Hall that just looked completely out of sync. And oh, it's over know, just, and over again. Weren't playing well, like yeah, it's, flat out. It's over and over again. It's like every time their team scores, you look up and those two guys are on the ice. Like it's been bad, man. Hopefully, hopefully there's an excuse we don't know about, like whether it's injuries or whatever. And if there's not, hopefully they can snap the hell out of it because this team needs them big time. And before we get into the Red Wings game, a massive piece of news dropped earlier yes. this week and i got a text from you lapore like literally you broke the news to me when this happened morgan riley out of nowhere signed an eight-year 60 million dollar contract extension that's a 7.5 million dollar cap hit like it was i wasn't expecting that at all i think a lot of us were expecting riley to maybe play out the season test 100%. free agency especially considering what a lot of these other defensemen signed for in the off season, but I, I was really happy to see him resign. I think it's a great number, seven and a half million per, I think it's right around his market value. You know, I, a lot of people are saying that if he did test the open market, he probably would have gotten more than the Leafs signed him for. But 
you know, when you look at the salary cap situation, you know, maybe there's a little bit, a little bit of a concern seeing how the Leafs are paying five guys a lot of money, but they're not the only team in that situation. And Riley is already making $5 million. It's a $2.5 million raise. You got Phil Kessel's $1.2 million retained salary coming off the books after this season. People but are forgetting all, about that. That I was think the first thing I really thought of. It was a really solid signing, Lepore. Yeah, 100%. And, and the, you said it was a surprise. Like, I was shocked, Bruno. Shocked. Like, I think the tweet Leafs PR put out was eight mo years. And I was like, what? And there's like open, open it's like I had the alerts set. And I, and I, I, I can't believe it. And then I saw the number and it's a totally fair number. And it's funny, like weird, man. It was like the day before, two days before I'm driving with my nephew in the car after hockey and small talking. I was telling him how the Leafs are going to play an outdoor game against the Sabres. And then you get the conversation. I'm like, yeah, they'll probably come out with a new Jersey for, uh, for that game. And he's like, oh, well, like, like I'm going to want it. And I think I'll get Riley this time because I don't have a Riley. And I no said way. to the, I said to the kid, I was like, you know what, buddy? Probably not a good idea because there's a very good chance Riley's not going to play for the Leafs after this season. So kind of cool that like the next day we found out this news. And it's funny, man. Like people always make the joke that the Leafs don't get nice things. Or like you always hear like fan bases like, mope and cry about how like oh like why can't we have nice things this contract for riley is a nice thing man like he got the eight years but 27 so he signed till he's 35 and there's the uh 10 team no trade clause that kicks in after year six so he can be traded i mean reasonably like at that point and so what what more could the Leafs have asked for like less money, like no, like really, like I, I don't, I, I always wonder, like you'll see a number come out for a signing. And the first thing that pops in my mind is always, okay, well, if, if it was 10 million, it's like, well, then what the player go in with? Or then like what the team go in with? Like this one to me, like all I can think is that like both sides came in pretty close. Like Riley must have sat down and said, guys, like I want to stay. So like, let, let, let's make this happen. Just treat, treat me reasonably and we'll get it done. And they did get it done. And if you want to question the value of it, I'll give you the list. I came across this list of defensemen in the National Hockey League and what they're getting paid. And make what you want of this list. It's not a list to start a debate of who's better or who's worse or who's overpaid or underpaid. But this is some of, these are some of the highest paid defensemen in the league. McCarr makes 9 million. Jones makes nine and a half. Warinsky, 9.6. Heiskin in eight. Hamilton, nine. Nurse, 9.25. Hedman, nine. Doughty, 10 and a half. Carlson, 11. Shabbat, eight. Roman Yossi, 9.25. Alex Pichangelo, 8.8. Brent Burns, eight. Subban, nine and a half. And Hughes, 7.85. And in comes Morgan Riley at seven and a half. So essentially perfectly slotted in. I think that's. That number is as close as possible, I think, to what he's actually worth. You think? Simply, like you, sim you, simply as that. Like, it, well, let's say if the Leafs could have done it and he would have got like eight or eight and a half, would you be like, man, that's an overpay? I think, I don't think the Leafs, because I, I would imagine that Riley's camp came in probably wanting north of eight or maybe even eight on the nose. Yeah, in so free think, agency, he would have got nine. In free agency, he would have yeah. got nine. And, yeah. and that's why, right? I think all Riley had to do was say, look at what some of these D-men signed for, you know, a couple of months ago. And the three that stick out to me just based on age and how, you know, close they are to Riley to a certain extent. You have Seth Jones, mm -hmm. who signed an eight-year deal for nine and a half per. Then you have Nurse, who signed a long-term contract for 9.25, and Dougie Hamilton, who signed for 9 million per. And all those guys are about one year apart from each other. And nice. Hamilton was the case where he actually went to free agency. And, and I get it. I think Dougie Hamilton's a better player than Morgan Riley, but Morgan Riley's very comparable to all three of those guys on a certain level. So to see him come in at 7.5, when you look at the contracts that those three guys got specifically, I think it's a, it's a really good number. I, again, I, I don't think the Leafs wanted to get too high just based on their salary cap situation, but I think they also understood this guy's our number one defenseman right now. He's been our number one defenseman for the last number of years. 
He's only 27 years old. He's a great skater. He produces a ton of offense from the back end and not even just like the points that he produces, the way he jumps into the play creates yeah, scoring different. chances. Like this team, Lapore, I, I was literally having very, very frightening thoughts thinking about how this defense core would look without Morgan Riley playing 24 minutes a night. And especially 100%. seeing how this defense core has played through the first nine games this season. Imagine, oh, imagine this decor without Morgan Riley, how awful no. it would look. I'd rather not. No. And I'd that's why when, when you put it in, into perspective like that, you understand that this had to get done because as far as I'm concerned, Lapore, if they had let Morgan Riley walk in free agency or even traded him, you're basically saying, okay, like it's over. Because how yeah. are you replacing him at that point? You, you're basically telling your top players, we just traded away or we just let our number one defenseman walk in free agency. Like, you know, the dream's over. We're, we're not yeah. going for anything now. We might as well enter like a rebuild or a retool or whatever you want to call it, right? If you're going to yeah. lose a player as good as Morgan Riley. Or you're going to get hosed because everyone knows you're desperate, exactly. right? Um, but yeah, the Kessel thing was huge. Like, I think a lot of people, um, when they saw that number, you just quick math. Well, Riley makes five. Now he's going to make seven and a half. The cap's not supposed to go up. Or even if it does, they say it's going to be like a million. So like, how are the Leafs going to do this? That Kessel, I think it's like 1.15. 1 1.2. Coming off the books, that's huge. That's absolutely huge. And there's other guys we'll see if they're around, like the McKayevs of the world and stuff. So, I mean, they'll, they'll, I'm sure they projected it and they're going to be able to make it, make it work. One very cool thing that somebody posted was George Armstrong, captain of the Toronto Maple Leafs, the last time they won the Stanley Cup in 1967. He has the record for most games played by a Toronto Maple Leafs player with 1,187. If Riley remains healthy during this deal, I think when this deal ends, and I may be getting this wrong, but I think that the number was that when this deal ends, he'll be close. Like if he stays relatively healthy, he'll be close to that number. And it makes sense because he was in the lineup very early in his career. Was it his first year? His first camp, wasn't it? As, it was a, like, as was, a 19 year old. He yeah. I remember playing, that was the, he was I remember that was the big shock. This team at 19. Yeah. I remember that was the big shock that he just made the team. And was like, what? <laughs> like the, the kid we drafted just now, but especially a defenseman. And of course we had fears with what happened to uh, Luke Shen before that, but it worked out for Mo. But uh, it's cool. Like, I mean, we'll see if other guys resign, like the Matthews, the Marners, and Willies, like Young. So maybe they would have a shot at that number as well. But I don't think anyone would have a problem if Riley ends up uh, clipping George Armstrong for that record. Yeah, and right now, as it stands, Lapore Riley has played 581 games as a Leaf. So the math sort of checks out. He plays another so he eight passes seasons. then. 82 yeah. Yeah, if he plays every game but yeah like he's got a chance to beat it yeah yeah and obviously there might be injuries and stuff like that but for the most part he's been a he's been a very durable player morgan riley the only season really where he missed a chunk of time was uh during the covid season where i forgot what it was was it like a a, a fractured leg or something like that i can't remember it was a lower body injury mm. he only played 47 out of 70 games back in 1920 but that was essentially the one year that he missed time and that, and that this season is, this, was a blur everybody got hurt remember exactly. all those injuries are a blur and, and and he's a guy that's just been through it all he, you mm -hmm. know like i said he's been here since he was 19 years old going back to 2013 2014 in his rookie season you know he was he's seen it all with this team he's been here through all the collapses all the coaching changes all the managerial changes and i think it speaks volumes because you could see how much his teammates respect him. He's one of the, the leaders on this team, both from the way that he plays and from you know a vocal standpoint in the locker room, the things that he does in the community. He's a very, very important part of this team. And again, you, you don't, I'm not going to sit here and say he's an elite defenseman, Lapore. I'm not going to put him in the category of you know Victor Hedman and Kale McCarr and guys who I think are the top, top defensemen in the league. But if you go down to that next tier of let's call them, yeah. you know, good to great players. I mean, Morgan Riley's right there. I've always called him a one B. He's a one B. He's not a one A. He's, he, he's a one B. Bruno, before I forget, how many games, games played, you say he has right now? 581. 581. So that means, yeah, he would pass it. 
he'd have 12 37 if he played all 82 games every season so assuming he misses some like yeah he's got a chance yeah he's gonna get really close to that are he sure. still only he'll still only be 35 when that deals up so he takes a few league league uh league men deals a la jason spezza to win his third, fourth, fifth, and sixth Stanley Cups, right? I love it, Lepore. I love it, man. <laughs> Why not? And you know what? He's a guy also, Morgan Riley. Like, I think he's going to age well just by the way that he skates and how he plays. And you know what? He doesn't get enough credit. Like, he's a strong guy. And it's not yeah. like he's going out there, you know, blowing guys up and laying five, six hits a night. But he's a really, really solid, you know, solidly built dude who can get in the corners. And again, he's not overly physical, but... I, I like the way that he plays, and I think that he's going to age well just based on his skating ability and his offensive sense for the game. So yeah, I I, I give it the stamp of approval. I think it's a really solid deal at seven and a half million, and and I'm happy. I'm happy for Morgan Riley and for the Leafs that he's going to be sticking around for a long time. Yeah, it, it's one of those deals I look at where I think it's very unlikely that a time's going to come during the uh during that deal where we'll be like shit like i wish we didn't have this like yeah and and especially when the cap goes up because it's going to go up eventually obviously it's been a flat cap situation for the last little while mostly because of covid and once the cap just continues to go up the contract is it's gonna look fine yeah i don't think people are gonna be pissed every second Every second defense, like number two defenseman, is going to be making seven plus million. So exactly, and and that's the thing, right? He he's a top pairing defenseman, and that's the number you got to sign these guys to, and and that's it's really as simple as that. Awesome, man. Awesome. All right, Lapore, let's move on to the final game of the week, Saturday let's night at home against the Detroit Red Wings. The Leafs mm-hmm. starting a five game home stand. And this was another game that I thought they had to have. I don't think it was the same situation as the 100%. Chicago game where it felt like their season was on the line, but it was also a game that you just, you felt like if they lost this one as well, then maybe some of those same thoughts and those negative feelings were going to creep back into not only the team, but fans of this hockey team, you know, <laughs> across the nation who are sitting on pins and needles every night hoping that this team doesn't embarrass itself again. So <laughs> it, it was good to see them finally uh, get you know, have a two-game winning streak this season. I mean, it's only two games, but it's better than what we've seen so far. And uh, Peter Morazic, he returned from his groin injury, making his second start of the season. He made 27 saves. I and mean, Morazic wasn't, wasn't very good in this game, I, I'll say, but he got the win, and, and that's all that matters. So the big story, Lapore heading into this game, and I alluded to this a little bit earlier, Justin Hall was scratched. Yeah. Sheldon Keefe had seen enough. You know, this is a guy that they protected in the expansion draft from Seattle. They were committed to him as one of their top four defensemen. The Leafs loved how he played last season with Muzzin, but Sheldon Keefe had said enough, had seen enough rather, decided to scratch Justin Hall. So they completely changed the defense pairings in this game. So we saw... Morgan Riley with Travis Dermott. We saw Jake Muzzin with TJ Brody. And then Timothy Lilligren drew into the lineup to create a third pair with Rasmus Sandin. The Swedish connection. And those guys looked pretty solid in this game. And the Leafs got the win without Justin Hall. They changed things up. And another thing I should mention, Lepore, the, the bigger story in this game from my perspective at least was John Tavares who Mm. who finally had his best game of the season three point night one goal and two assists and out of nowhere I'll say very quietly John Tavares Michael Lepore now leads the Toronto Maple Leafs in scoring with nine points in seven games sorry with seven points in nine games and sure you'd like to see Matthews and Marner with 12 points in nine games averaging over a point a game but John Tavares, it looks like he's got his legs back. He's playing better. He's creating more scoring chances. Now you're finally starting to see the puck go in for him. So it was, it's been so good to see Tavares return back to the John Tavares that we know that he can be. Yeah, 100%. 100%. JT, man, kind of, kind of similar to Morgan Riley in that category of Tough to hate them, and you love to have them on your team. And as Lee says, we should be grateful to have them wearing the blue and white. Yeah, 100%. But 
I mean, those were the those are the big storylines from that game. Alex Kerfoot also a couple of points. That that line in general, the Tavares, Marner, and Kerfoot line. Marner, as we mentioned, scored his first goal in 17 games, regular season and playoffs combined. Kerfoot with a couple of points. And even Jake Muzzin, yeah. after you know, he had had a brutal stretch. He had a two-point night as well with a goal and an assist. So that was nice to see him bounce back because mm-hmm. Listen, like Jake Muzzin makes $5 million a year. If they had to scratch one of those guys, they're obviously going to scratch Justin Hall. Like there's just no scenario ever where Sheldon Keefe is just going to scratch Jake Muzzin, even though you could argue that he had been playing just as poorly as Justin Hall and they both deserve to be scratched. Honestly, it would have been a really bad look though. You're right. But yeah, that would have been, I mean, who knows? The Leafs Twitter would have lost its mind. (laughs) if Jake Muzzin actually was a healthy scratch in one of these games. But no, it was nice to see him bounce back as well, Lepore. But all in all, a solid effort from the Leafs, even though it got a little bit dicey towards the end. But they uh, they hung on for a 5-4 win. Yeah, I'll I'll just run through this one quickly. As you mentioned, uh, it was Muzzin who uh, scored the goal. It was late in the first period. Coming in off the left, coming in off the point on the left side, was able to get the shot and uh, scored Jake with the goal. 1-0 Leafs. Um, Leafs had some chances in the first, uh, Kerfoot hit a post and bunting actually had a big chance and close that he was robbed on. Um, moving on to the second period, I'm hoping in the order of this, right. But it was Angval. Angval had a breakaway and it was one of those ones where, okay, clean breakaway up by one, make it two. No, no. God forbid. God forbid. Right. So misses the breakaway. Red Wings come up, come back the other way. On the power play, it was uh, Zadina off the post and in. Great shot, I thought. There was a lot of hype uh, around this kid when he entered the league. And people thought, uh, at the time, anyway, people were surprised to see him like drop in the draft as low as he did. Not that he dropped dropped drastically, but like a few spots. Uh, A little later, Jason Spezza, always reliable, with a cute little pass to Bunting, who got the redirect in. So it was uh, uh, at that point, it was uh, two to one for the Leafs. And then early in the third, it was weird because the Leafs scored right at the end of the first, right at the end of the second, and then early in the third. And that, early in they the usually third, get scored on in those situations yeah. before. Weird. But uh, yeah, it was uh, Tavares with an unbelievable move behind the net, finds Kerfoot. It's an easy goal. And uh, the Leafs at this point uh, go up three to one, a little breathing room, but why not make it interesting? Uh, Valido uh, scores to make it a one goal game after uh, Dermot and Matthews got their wires crossed behind the net. I'm not even sure exactly what happened there. Like who thought which, like who thought what the other guy was doing or like, I don't know. It, it just looked bad. And Matthews was disgusted with himself after, but Leafs, Leafs uh, back in the game, only up by one. Kerfoot and Tavares again, though, this time uh, Alexander returns the favor, sliding it over to JT, who goes off the crossbar and in for two. Uh, the Leafs, again, man, similar to that game against Carolina, the Leafs were on this goal running around in their own end, like guys over committing, making this like fundamental mistakes, like zone mistakes, missing assignments, and they can't have it. It's a bad look. There's, so. there's still been some defensive issues that they got. Yeah, like, man, not good. And then Nemesikov was able to make it a one goal game again. So at this point, four, three, but then Marner with the empty net goal, well, not the literal empty net goal, but an open net goal after a giveaway. Great play. Like, like at first, you, at first you see it and you're just like a oh, trash goal. The guy gave it to him, but like his anticipation to like, caught in at the right time and get the stick there. Cause he figured the guy was going to go there and be able to control it and slide it in. We mentioned earlier how great it was for Marner to get on the board and get a goal. And hopefully he feels good about himself today. And it continues forward into this week with the, the three home games. Um, uh, Heronic was able to blast one because I can, why not make it interesting? <laughs> so like absolutely smashes one. I think it's like 30 seconds left off the post and in. So five, four Leafs, and uh, they were able to hold on to that score line. Some final numbers for the game. The Leafs outshot the wings 38 to 31. Uh, good showing after the first two periods, the Leafs, uh, the uh, wings had, um, had some uh, fire at the end, but the Leafs are out shooting them 30 to 18 after two periods 
And uh, according to Money Puck, the Leafs would win this game 74% of the time based on the way they played. So good showing. It's a winning streak. And I will say it. I'm sure a lot of Leafs fans felt this way after the Carolina game. Three, five, and one. But you look ahead and you see that Chicago team in that situation. And then you see Detroit at home on a Saturday night. Let's get these two wins. Let's get to 500. And off we go. So we can just look in the mirror to our bad start and say, you know what? At this point, we're 500. Let's dial in now. Let's go, boys. So hopefully that's how they feel. And hopefully uh, that's what we see this week with, like I said, three home games. And even though they had some defensive breakdowns in this game and just as a whole, the team defense has not been nearly as good as last season, but it was finally, finally good to see the offense break out here. And we still haven't seen the explosion from Matthews and even Nylander for that matter, just playing together. They Mm -hmm. haven't had their, you know, big breakout moment yet as a line, but it was good to see the Leafs score five goals. And if you think about it, Lepore, you know, just going through the Matthews and Marner era, this team has never gotten off to a bad start. Like this is the first season that they have gotten off to a rough start and where people have been like legitimately you know, concerned Mm -hmm. with this team, especially after what happened last season in the playoffs, blowing the three, one lead to Montreal. So it's been the first like early season adversity this team has had to go through. Like really, if you go look through their game logs over the last five seasons, the Leafs always get out to a good start. And I'm not saying, you know, they're winning seven of their first eight games or going undefeated, but there's never been a situation where they've been, you know, two, three, four games under 500 and really fighting it and having to, to really get through some tough times. So to see them battle back to 500 and to see that Tavares line finally click and to see the offense get rolling and to see Marner get his confidence back, that is all good to see. And now hopefully, because again, I think Matthews is going to be fine. He's getting a lot of scoring chances. The points are going to come. The big concern for me still, Lepore, is they have to clean things up defensively. I think that is the big glaring issue I'm seeing at the moment. Obviously, other than the fact that the offense didn't break out really until this game, and they, you know, yeah. they were scoring essentially like barely over two goals a game. And if you still look at it, just in terms of goals per game right now, the Leafs, it, it's not good. Where do they rank in the league? I have it up here. They're twenty oh, seventh in the league, oh my averaging two point three goals per game that is the complete opposite of what this team has done over the last five seasons they have consistently been top five in the nhl in goals per game so you would think that that's good there's going to be some positive regression there things are going to turn around but yeah the defensive numbers lapore i'm still concerned and i i really hope that they find a way to clean it up no you're 100 right like with the offense the way i just see it it's just about math i mean if you get a certain amount of shots at the end of the day, if he keeps going, you are going to get rewarded. Like these numbers that we've had lately with like Marner's drought and Matthews, like they don't make sense. Like based on the history of hockey, it doesn't make sense to get for guys to go 50 shots without a goal. So that's not worrisome. And with those, the underlying numbers are good. Like they posted a stat. I forget. Was it during the Chicago game or was it during the Carolina game where like the Leafs uh, here's a team unable to score. And they were like first in scoring chances, first in high danger chances, first in slot chances. Like it's just not going in. Yeah, and I, I remember day, seeing that graphic as well. Yeah, like at the end of the day, eventually it's going to go in. But like you said, on the defensive side, like, no, you can't galaxy brain that one into thinking it's going to go positively. You have to fix the mistakes. It's missed assignments. It's fundamental. So to agree with you, the offensive side is not worrisome. It'll come, and I'm sure there's some confirmation bias <laughs> with that. But defensively is where alarm bells are going off for me a little bit. We got to be better. We got to be better. We can't keep relying on Campbell. We really can't. A hundred percent. And speaking of alarm bells going off, Lapore, just looking at all the players across this roster after the first nine games, is mm-hmm. there anyone that sticks out to you from a negative perspective or a positive perspective from that matter in terms of the way they've played so far. I mean, we, uh, we already touched on Hall and Muzzin, like so far they've been disappointing. That's the only way to, uh, 
there's, there's no way to sugarcoat it. Like they haven't been good enough and they're good players. So we rely on them and they have to be good for this team to be successful. Um, I'll focus in on like the new guys. I mean, Conf and Kasha to me have been kind of what's what we all thought they would be. I mean, they're good defensively. Their transition numbers are amazing. Like those geeks to keep track of like the defensive zone starts that end up in the other end. Like their numbers are A plus in that category. So that's nice to see for what those guys are making. Uh, Bunting's got three goals. So, I mean, at the end of the day, at this point in the season, you couldn't really ask for more than him. And the thing yeah. is with him, sorry. No, I was going to say three goals and five and five okay. points for Bunting. So that's a, yeah. that's a solid start for him. There you go. So like for him too, with bunting, it's obvious because like the the efforts there, the drives there, you see him skating his ass off every shift. So it's great. On the flip side is uh Nick Ritchie, man. He's been bad, like bad, like the opposite of bunting, because bunting, even if he wasn't producing, he's relevant. He's relevant. And so you would see the effort being made and you would see the contribution with Richie. I am seeing nothing and comment down below if you're a coach and I'm missing something, but I am seeing absolutely nothing from that guy. You often hear the word ghost being used in hockey. Nick Richie has been an absolute ghost for the Toronto Maple Leafs and they paid him, man. That guy got a $5 million two-year deal, 2.5 million on the cap. And to beat a dead horse, the Leafs have to be careful with how they spend their money because of their big boys. And right now, it doesn't look good. And and I will say, like, kind of like with the bunting thing, like how, let's say he wasn't scoring. I would at least look at it and be like, hey, I see what the management saw. Like giving this guy, like things could go well for this guy. He could put up points with Richie. And I, I don't say this often. I'd like to look Kyle Dubas in the eyes and ask him, Kyle, like, what did you see here that this was worth $5 million spread over two years? Like, what did you anticipate? What did you think he was going to provide? And just the ultimate slap in the face was that game against Carolina, because like, as we mentioned before, how strong of a team we think they are. One of the things that jumped out to me was that when you watch them play, whether it's the star players or the guys you've never heard of, it's very clear when that team has the puck And when they don't have the puck, everybody has a responsibility and everybody serves a purpose. Every player is dialed in and you just see like, it works almost like a flow. It looks like a machine, like without trying to sound cheesy. And when you see Richie, I'm just like, what do you provide right now? Other than filling a spot in the lineup? Like, Am I seeing big hits? Am I seeing four checking? Am I seeing scoring chances? Like, like I'm not seeing anything. Like, and we've talked about it in the past. And I mentioned to other friends of mine where you could have told me there's certain games already so far this season. You could tell me that Richie hadn't played. And I wouldn't, and I wouldn't have noticed because like that little contribution, again, not getting scoring chances. Oh, it's not going in. It'll go in eventually. No, no, no. You're just not doing anything. Like I, I'd like to see, I don't know if they keep, they must keep track of this almost like individual player puck possession. Cause like, or like, t- like in soccer, how they keep track of like touches on the ball. Like for him, it must be, the numbers are probably pathetic. Like yeah, never he, has he's the been puck. awful. Yeah. He's been awful. Like blast him into the sun. Like, like I, I'm going to say it like bad, bad, bad. But... There's no way to sugarcoat it. This was a bad signing. Yeah. And again, you know, you look back to the off season, you say, okay, he had a career year and a career year for him was 15 goals and 56 games for the Boston Bruins. And, you know, you think that he can provide physicality and that grit factor that we all love to talk about, something that we all say the Leafs are are lacking every season. And you thought, okay, if he's going to play with the big boys, he's going to chip in another 15, 20 goals, no problem. But he got a shot with the Leafs' best players early in the season, wasn't doing it. Sheldon Keefe said, screw this. I'm demoting you to the fourth line. And now the Leafs have a situation, like you mentioned, Lepore, where they have a fourth liner making two and a half million against the salary cap, who's providing nothing. He's got zero goals, one assisted nine games. He has 11 shots on goal in nine games. So he's essentially averaging one shot on goal a game. And I would imagine that most of those shots have probably come on the second power play unit because 
He's been that net front presence on the second power play unit. And that's probably where he got his, his shots. I'd have to take a look at that, but that that's been a disaster. Now, in terms of who's impressed me, I've been very hard on Wayne Simmons, you know, since he's been a Toronto Maple Leaf, but I think he's looked really solid with Jason Spezza. Yeah, sure. Like that fourth line has been solid. And even the third line, Lepore, like you mentioned with, with David Camp and Andre Kasha and Pierre Engvall, I've seen some, some really good hockey from them as well. And it's funny because everyone loves to make fun of the Leafs for their salary cap situation and how they're paying five guys 58% of the cap and how are they going to make it work? They need, they're going to be signing all these league men players, but earth to everyone, it's been the Leafs depth players that have actually been like some of their best players this season. Jason Spezza is not a $750,000 player, man. Exactly. And and when you just look at, at pure production, the issue has not been the bottom half of the Leafs lineup. It's been the big boys who have not answered the bell so far. And the reason that the Leafs currently rank 27th in the NHL in goals per game. Mm. So it hasn't been the guys at the bottom of the roster who, you know, quote unquote, Dubas picked up off the scrap heap. Like just go and look at, look at the, the stats right now. Like Michael Bunting, three goals, five points in nine games. Kerfoot has a couple of goals, four points. Engvall has three points. Kasha with a goal, a couple of points. Like, again, it's not like these guys are lighting the world on fire, but they're essentially doing what you expect them to do. They're contributing. And exactly. And then you look <laughs> yeah. at Mitch Marner. I mean, we, we've talked about this. Only three points in nine games. Matthews, two points in six games. Like, who had that over their first 15 combined games this year that Marner and Matthews would have five combined points? Like, it's two almost goals. impossible. Yeah, two goals. Five points, two goals, and 15 combined games for those two. So it's the top guys in the lineup that obviously have to get it going. So I've, again, with all the new guys that were brought in, I've I've been pleased, honestly, outside of Nick Ritchie with how they have played. I've also liked, for the most part, how Rasmus Sandin has looked. And I know there's been moments where he's been out-muscled for the puck and... You know, again, going back to even last year against Montreal, those were the things you were concerned about with him. But he's creating scoring chances. He's looked good on the power play. Yeah. And for the most part, again, it's just, it's been these, it's been their best players that have to get it going. And it's not just the Leafs. There's other teams around the league. You even look at the Boston Bruins. Like David Pasternak is off to a slow start. Yeah, I haven't heard his name. Tampa, like they've, they've been struggling. Tampa's essentially a 500 team right now. Like Colorado hasn't been able... To get it going. McKinnon missed some time in COVID protocol and, and they've been dealing with some injuries as well. So it's not just the Leafs. There's, there's really good players across the league that have not gotten it going offensively. And you would think with a lot of these star players that as time goes on, positive regression is going to hit. And a lot of these guys are just going to start producing close to, or even at their normal rate that they usually produce at. Yeah, I, I wonder how much of it is. And I, I actually saw an interview with Shanahan uh, on the Leafs YouTube channel talk about this, where after the type of regular season the team had last year and after what happened in the playoffs, this team going into the season has to remember that the regular season still matters. And I'm not sitting here saying that like these star players are kind of just putting the regular season in the back of their mind. But I've always said the only thing that really motivates people is fear. And I guess at this point, the Leafs star players don't have that fire or fear in the back of their head to kick up their game a notch. And even beyond the Leafs, like you mentioned, all those other teams, whereas you look at a Colorado after the regular season, they had everyone picking them them to win the Stanley Cup and then to go out like they did against Vegas. It's kind of hard to get pumped up for the regular season. And especially when you're looking and this is going to be this should be an 82 game regular season. So maybe it's a little bit of that. I mean, it's a discussion as to why some of these teams aren't performing at the level we expect them to. But <laughs> in uh, it's a little different for the Leafs because in Leafland, you're going to get more attention. And when you're making the kind of money those guys are making, you better produce because the vultures will come out, man, and it'll get ugly in a hurry. And I don't think that'll happen. I don't think it'll get to that. But it could, and it wouldn't be pretty if it does. Because it'll turn quickly. Leafs fans will turn quickly, and the media will have a friggin' field day with it. 
and it's it's a tough schedule coming up. And I guess I say Big tough time. just based on how these teams that they're playing next week have you know played over the last number of years. But they got Vegas on Tuesday, the Lightning on Thursday, and the Bruins on Saturday. And like I Piece mentioned, like if you look at the Atlantic Division standings right now, Tampa's in fourth, the Leafs are in fifth, and Boston is in sixth place. Great. Those Buffalo like, Sabres, eh? <laughs> who had who had the top three in the Atlantic through the first, you know, seven to nine games as Florida one, Buffalo two, and Detroit number three? Wait a minute, then who are we forgetting? What's Montreal's record, Bruno? Montreal is two and seven. They are in that was a joke. That, that, that was a joke. Right I just wanted you to say the Montreal Canadians <laughs> <laughs> record on the podcast. I, I figured you wanted me to just mention the Habs there, but yes, they are in uh, dead last with this a has minus be- 13 goal differential in nine games. Brutal. This has got to be a record for us. How long have we been recording for? And we haven't mentioned the Montreal Canadiens. I think this is a GFP record for sure. I mean, yeah. I, we always have to get in a Montreal Canadiens jab. Yeah. yeah. Brendan I mean, Gallagher, we almost went an entire uh, podcast without mentioning them. How dare we do something like that? Yeah. We'll do a Brendan Gallagher jersey giveaway next week to, uh, to celebrate our accomplishment. Oh man, these, these Habs. I mean, we can do an entire podcast on how awful that team has been. You talk about the Blackhawks. I mean, my God, you look at this Habs team as well. They are in major, major trouble. But again, this Atlantic division has been extremely wacky to start the season. And you can go through some of the other divisions as well. Like who had Colorado at four and four right now with a minus three goal differential after eight games. Yeah. Vegas as well. Same thing. Four and four. Like it's just crazy. I was going to say yeah, they've is, had injuries. They've had a weird injuries. start. What's yeah. that, Laporte? Uh, Vegas had some injuries. They've had a weird start too. Yeah. Yeah. So there's just there's just some weird things happening across the league. But Laporte, any any final thoughts before we wrap up this podcast? Uh, just I'm looking forward to this week because, like I said, the team was able to get uh, back to 500. I think I made a mistake earlier saying they were five five and one. They're four four and one. Um, it's been nine games, not eleven. But uh, at that mark, and you're playing three good teams, you're playing them at home. So I say often on this show, like, I'd like to see them dial in, dial in boys. Like, let's see it. Like we, we had a good finish of the week with two wins and the Riley signing. Let's keep this positive momentum going. Let's see it, boys. You said it. That's the big thing. Keep it going. Rack up a couple more wins this week. I want to see the offense continue on this trend that we've seen over the last couple of games. Mm -hmm. But again, the big thing is, and I keep harping on this, they got to clean things up defensively. And it'll be a good test this week against Vegas, Tampa, and Boston. Yeah. All right, everybody. That is going to do it. For episode 39 of the Gluttons for Punishment podcast, or GFP, a Toronto Maple Leafs and NHL podcast hosted by Michael Lepore and Anthony Bruno. Once again, if you're a new listener and you enjoyed the show, it would be a big time help if you give us a five-star rating and review on Apple. And then, of course, if you are watching us on YouTube, we would appreciate it so much if you smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, and ring the notification bell so you know exactly when the GFP podcast is posting some new content. So for Michael Lepore, I'm Anthony Bruno. Happy Halloween, everyone. And we will see you in the next one. Thanks, everyone.